There's no time. Right here we are back again with episode 142. Ted Sirios and photography. Yes. Yeah. This was actually since we had done true crime topics for the last two weeks. We did Madeline McCann and we did uh, serial killer Robert Picton. I think before week before that. So I figured, okay, well now it's time to do a paranormal or historical mystery type of uh, thing. So I was asking Tom for ideas, and he came up with this particular yeah. topic. Yeah, what well, story behind this one is, for those of you who are not regular listeners, when I was 13, I had this poltergeist event in my family. And uh, Jenny wrote a book about it. Anyway, later on, I ended up seeing this documentary about this guy who was taking cameras and putting them up to his head and clicking, hitting the trigger to take a photograph. And he would go, and he would go oh, I think I got that. I think I got something on that one. Or, ah, that one didn't do it. And then later they would develop the film. And it was mostly just pictures of him looking into the cameras or all white ones or all black ones. But every now and then there'd be a mysterious photograph or an image on that film. And it was never really explained how he could do it. Some people thought it was some kind of a trick. But he said he was putting his thoughts or his psychic images onto this film. And he had a psychiatrist that was kind of believing in it and it was and was taking him on tour yeah and they couldn't really debunk the guy uh, I've seen the photographs they're they're weird photographs but uh, I wanted Jenny to try to get down to the bottom of it if she could and just see what she you know came up with because it seemed kind of plausible to me at the time and another thing that was weird is that I was thinking well if it's fake then he would be able to do it all the time but evidently he can't do it most of the time. You know, he's only done it a few times. And it just kind of, kind of, you know, I was a kid the last time I, I, I looked into it. It just, at the time, it seemed like there might have been something to it. Yeah, I think the first thing I heard about it, because when when we were trying to come up with a topic for the show, when we were talking, you said, you said let's do a show about that guy that can uh, put pictures on, you know, film, like, just from his imagination. Yeah, and he did do it drunk. Which that, that, I was like, yeah, yeah. that may be. Yeah. And I couldn't, um, <laughs> I couldn't remember his name, but then I Googled it. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that guy. And then, like, I found all the yeah. little video clips and stuff. And I remembered seeing this on, I think I saw it on Arthur C. Clarke's, Arthur C. Clarke's World of Mysterious Powers or maybe whatever that show was called. Maybe like, from the late 60s, early 70s. Um, there was, like, a, there was a show that was, I think it was about, like, just spirit photography type uh things or photographic anomalies or whatever and they they had like a maybe five or six minute segment about todd uh ted serious on that um there was also a show and i think it's on youtube because i watched it the other day it was like some big long like hour and a half two hour long thing with like raymond burr hosting and it was just like about psychic phenomena in general and um, that ha also had a section on this type of, uh, you know, thoughtography, as they call it, and yeah. Ted series, and they t kind of talked about that a little bit on there. I think I saw either one of those too. But there was like a part in the, there was a part in the program where he walks by a video camera. They had some kind of a convention, or he was maybe doing some kind of press release. And he walks by a video camera, and somebody goes, "Ted, Ted, do the camera, do the camera," and he re goes up to the news camera and looks into it, and does something, and then there was like a. a uh, just an image. I think it was a, a like a still image of a of a, a landscape or something. I don't remember exactly what it was. I remember seeing it as a kid, and being kind of mystified. I, I I don't know if it was real though. Yeah. You know, it, but they were looking for a. They, they were trying to debunk the guy and catch him playing some kind of sight sleight of hand trick, but they never really could. As far as I as far as I remember. Yeah. Um, well, you don't think there's more to it than that? The, there, there is more to there it. There is than more that. to it. Than that. Okay. Okay. Well, why don't we get the other stuff out of the way and then we'll get into this case? Yeah. I just had a couple of shout outs to uh, do before we kind of get into the topic at hand. And we actually have two new patrons 
Uh, they've actually, I think they came on a couple weeks ago, but we recorded some ahead of time, so I didn't get to like uh, announce them on the last show. So we have two new patrons named Damien and Dwayne. So hey, you guys, thank you very much for your support. Thanks for joining. Everything you guys do helps us out. I've also got like a lot of really nice uh, like email messages and stuff like that in the past couple weeks about um, just people talking about how they really appreciate our show. and. Yeah, we're real grateful, especially in a time when basically um new members have stalled channel growth has just fucking just stalled because and it's not just us it's everybody youtube has changed the algorithms and channels don't grow like they used to we used to be able to get you know 100 new subs a, a day sometimes you know but no not anymore it's weird lucky to get like a couple a week yeah I so mean, you, you know, know we're well, lucky i guess to have patrons well, yeah. yeah, we're definitely lucky to have patrons yeah. and lucky to have subscribers. And if we were starting out right now, we would never would get patrons at the rate that we're gaining. Yeah, because YouTube has everybody kind of shadow banned. But like I said, I really appreciate all the messages that I yeah. get from you guys, and you know, we just we mostly just yeah, we have Patreon and stuff, but we mostly just do this for fun because you know we like to do it and we like interacting with you guys and. Hopefully give y'all something fun to listen yeah. to while you're doing whatever you do when you're working or you're just yeah. hanging out in your house or whatever. So that's really cool and I really like getting all those messages. So I just thought I would say that yeah. uh, in case I didn't get back to everybody individually, although I do try to do that uh, eventually. Yeah, she's getting busy. She's writing books, uh, new job stuff. She's doing um, writing articles for a paranormal program so a lot of stuff going on yeah and honestly yeah. faceless villain 3 is coming along yeah. quite well too i've just i've just been working on the 1987 chapter today so this is the volume 3 is going to be from 1980 to 1999 it'll be version. out by the end of the year yeah i'm shooting for yeah. august yeah september at the latest i mean i it's on track right now to be done by then it's uh, selling too part one and two selling well yeah. Yeah. So I'm kind of hoping once the trilogy is done, and like I said, once the trilogy is done, I'm considering either starting another trilogy about like creepy disappearances, or I might do a fourth unsolved murder one that's like new millennium type thing. It depends on how it goes. Like yeah. from 2000 to 2019. You know what I mean? I might right. do that because that would be kind of in line with uh, the rest of the series. Yeah, it is a 20 year period. So yeah, that's right. what I mean. So, uh, I, I don't know. I'll just, I'll figure out what to do when, when volume three is done and I'll see what I feel like doing when I get yeah. to the end of the year and get that project out of the way. So let's talk a little bit about now the, the whole thing about thoughtography. Um, it actually predates, uh, Ted Sirius. There were other people claiming to be able to do this, like going back to like the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and I think that actually the term thoughtography was sort of, sort of coined in Japan. Um, but I think we'll talk about that like on the second half of the show, cause we can kind of go into like a few of the other people like prior to Ted Sirius that, uh, that claim to be able to do this. Now, this is not spirit photography. Um, spirit photography is kind of like your thing where, you know, Victorian era, when you know photography was still kind of a new art form and you would get these photos like people would produce photos with like double exposures and stuff like that that looked like there was a ghost in there like there's yeah. a very famous one with mary todd lincoln that looks like the you know the assassinated abe lincoln is like standing behind her with a yeah they're obviously the hand false they're yeah obviously and fake. they're they're not very good fakes i mean yeah. they're pretty good for the time because they didn't have photoshop back then you guys they had yeah. to do everything the hard way um but it's interesting because a few years ago I was in, I guess it was in New York and it was either at the Met or MoMA. I can't remember where I was, but they actually had an exhibition about um, all these kind of like Victorian uh, spirit photography and seance photography and stuff like that. And it would kind of say uh, how they did them and all this other stuff. But they were still, even though you know that they're fake, they're still really cool to look at. And like some of the images are like really creepy and it's, and it's kind of cool to think of how, you know, they did them before. Cause now it's like, like I said, it's like super easy to do this. I can do a picture like that in fucking five minutes in Photoshop as most people probably could. But the fact that they had to go through so much work to do them like back then, and they, some of them actually 
were pretty cool looking, even though you could tell most of them were... Yeah, they were bilking people out of money. Super fake. Yeah, and it's like, I I wondered at the time when we were talking about this the other day, I said, I wondered, did people, if you got something like that produced, it's like, did you know that that was fake or did you just want to believe that that was real? It's like, yeah, I wanted to believe I that was how... my dead wife back there. I think there was a, I think there was a certain kind of novelty to it because how could you believe that that was a photograph of your dead husband? When it's obviously a reproduction of an old photograph that you had already had. Yeah, because back then it's like getting photographed was like right. a big deal, and there was only right. one or two pictures of people. Yeah, so they it's just like, superimposed him in, with just had, and they put some like, mist around him, and there he is. He's it's like visiting. funny that looks like the only photo that was yeah. ever taken of this I'm, dude while he was alive. <laughs> and I'm thinking that what it is is that you took your old photo to the photographer and asked for that. Yeah, can you and ghost this up? Ghost him in, in there with me, <laughs> so you know what I mean. He's still with us. I think that's. That's it what a lot of it looked like to me. Yeah. I think it kind of stemmed from the same, this is kind of morbid too, but I think it kind of stemmed from the same mindset where people would take pictures with their dead babies or yeah. like their dead relatives, just because like I said, photography was, it was a big deal. So that was like the only picture that you had yeah. of that person. So it's like, yeah. well, I guess we'll have to take it after they're dead since we uh, get, didn't get one when they were alive. So I think real... that was kind of like. Maybe. Yeah, there's a real creepy one of a living girl. She's alive, about seven, laying down next to her dead brother, smiling and can, shit like yeah, that. Yeah, can you imagine? Like that's shit. a yeah. Victorians man. They but were that so was weird. the only picture they had of the kid. I guess that's what so I they, mean. And it's like maybe it wasn't weird to them, but it's yeah. like, hey, little Susie, why don't you go down lay next to little Bobby Jr. over there? <laughs> yeah, we'll Mom. take a picture so we'll remember what he looked like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like oh, it's just like so weird. I don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so. Spirit photography, that's a totally different thing. Photography doesn't really, I mean, yes, it's considered paranormal in the sense that it's like, you know, if it's real, it's thought to be caused by someone's like psychic, psychokinesis. Like I can project my thoughts like with energy or whatever, like onto film. So it's paranormal in that sense, but it doesn't have anything to do with like dead people coming back to life or nothing like that. So it's more a psychokinetic poltergeist. Yeah, if you can move a big thing. solid object, why couldn't you do this? Well, you know, Nikola Tesla, in an offhand way, sort of thought that something like this might be possible. Mm -hmm. Like, he was kind of saying something like, um, he thought that it might be possible to pro like, project your thoughts onto, like, a, an outside retina, like a television screen a television type screen of is thing. television screen, yeah. Yeah. So... I think there's some, actually some new guys that would kind of agree with him that there may be a way to do that. Yeah. Because there are some people that are, I think, researching consciousness, and they thought that maybe you might be able to upload and download information in and out of the human mind through the eye. Yeah, th I think that's, that's kind of what shit. Tesla was getting at. Right. So he did really, and I'm not saying, I don't know if it's possible or not, but I mean, he did seem to think that that was something that was within the realm Evidently, they still think that, which I don't know how that would work, but there are some people that are saying, no, you could do that, which I don't, yeah, you know, and I there's... Mean, and they supposedly would know. Maybe thought in some weird way. Well, maybe it's just like some, some kind of some electromagnetic Yeah, inside response. the back of the eye. Yeah. Well, they did videotape the vis what that cat saw. They tapped into a cat's head. You can look on it on YouTube. They tapped, put some electrodes into a cat's brain. And then they hooked those wires up to a computer and put that onto a camera. So you could see on a screen. Or excuse me, they put it onto a screen, to a monitor. You could see through the cat's eyes on that yeah, monitor. Yeah, like what the cat was seeing. What the cat was seeing. It was kind of fuzzy. But then a person gets in front of that cat and looks at it. And you could see the person looking at the cat. But what was weird is that when you're looking at the cat's version of what you're seeing, you know what I mean? You're looking mm -hmm. at the screen. That person looks awful cat-like. The eyes kind of look like cat eyes. And it looked like that guy had big old cat ears on him. It's the creepiest thing. It's there on YouTube. I hope that's what kitties really think because yeah. I would love to think that Baby Cookie looks at us and goes, Hi, Big cats. Big mommy and daddy kitty. Yeah, so. so <laughs> we look like big two legged kitties. Yeah, so evidently, you're not. <laughs> it's not just exactly what the cat sees, it's what the cat perceives. Yeah. So it perceives a human being as just being a big cat. That well, yeah. Faces are all kind of like cat faces. I guess you they know? would. I mean, Weird. in some ways. Trips me out. But, you know, that's why, see, that's why I don't think it's weird that, like, we yeah. call ourselves, like, you know, her, her mom and dad, because, like, that's right. probably how she sees it. Okay. She's like, she sees us as just, like, big cats <laughs> walking around. Right. I don't think, I think she just sees herself as a human. When she looks at it, when she looks in a mirror, she sees herself 
with, li- with little hum- human ears. I do feel like probably she probably like thinks she's more like yeah. I think she thinks she's a tiny buddy fuzzy person mm. rather than seeing us as like two cats because yeah. just the way she interacts and like lays around she yeah. she sleeps like a person like yeah. on her back like nah you know yeah. what I mean so I yeah I we gotta get back to serious, I definitely like. think she's on it she's thinks she's a person all right so let's talk about Ted Sirius yeah. now he was originally from uh, Chicago. Uh, he had been a bellhop at a hotel, but he was unemployed um, when his uh, talents came to the attention of the media or whatever. Now, the first person that I'm not really sure a lot of the, you know, a lot of the um, biographical information about him doesn't really say how him and this psychiatrist got hooked up. I don't know if he was like, if Ted was, was like on what? TV or if he was right. a patient, but well, I don't think so because Ted was from Chicago and, uh, Jewel Eisenbud, who was the psychiatrist, he was from Denver. So I feel like, I don't know if he saw him on TV. Somehow these two hooked up or, but yeah, yeah. so they hooked and, and they were in like a three year long, uh, thing where they would like quote unquote experiment with this thing that he said he could do. It was the um, damnest thing too. Dude. Eisenbud br- eventually yeah. ended up writing a book about him and all this yeah. other stuff. Eisenbud so. would show up with a whole bunch of booze and get Ted drunk and and give him a camera and a bunch of film, and uh, Ted would try to take pictures of his thoughts. Now, the only thing he needed is he had he needed this thing he called a gizmo, which was a rolled up tube of cardboard. Or paper. It was like black paper. Black paper. It usually came from because usually, um, I think they started out using like kind of a traditional camera, but then you know, as the sixties and seventies went on, they ended up using a Polaroid. Um, so I think he used like the paper from like some of the packaging. Okay, from rolled the it up Polaroid into a tube and rolled it up into a tube. And then it, he would uh, put his put his eye put it on on the lens of the camera and put it to his eye. That's how I remember him doing it. Is that did that check out? Yeah, and then he would press it. And then he would press the trigger to take a photograph. Yeah, he would either like have it in right. his hand or something like that. Right. He said he needed it. He needed to focus his thoughts and his and, and to, to focus keep, his to keep the lights on. out. And we and we he had all these. He didn't. He wasn't sure. He claimed that he did. He didn't really know how it worked. Yeah. That, well, it just he felt like he had to have it. Yeah. That's basically what he said. Um, and another thing he said too that I thought was kind of interesting was that even when you know these photographs actually like had something on them he was not it's not like he could predict what the photo was going to be beforehand or anything like that it's like he was always kind of like oh well it's not that the picture is what i'm imagining at the moment it's almost more like he said it was more like he was channeling it from somewhere right so it's so it's not like oh i'm he gonna control the picture oh i'm gonna think about you know right. uh, a chevette and then right. a picture of a chevette comes out right. like he said it didn't really work like that right. i guess it was a random picture yeah Basically most of the he's time saying. he's saying it's random now as i said um this him and the psychiatrist would do these sessions now ted serios was a pretty bad uh alcoholic yeah he also, and according to Dr. Eisenbud, was also a sociopath. Um, he was not, so he was not like a real pleasant person to be around. So these sessions where they would do these photographs would sometimes last eight to ten hours. Um, Dr. Eisenbud would bring him vodka, would bring him alcohol, and he would just get drunker and drunker. And as he got drunker, he would start like, um, taking off his clothes. He would start, um, like banging his head on the floor. Um, he would start just like, you know, just doing crazy shit. He would go infantile. Yeah. He would just start running and like start wailing and yeah. crying and like all this other kind of stuff, like and running around the room, like an ape and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and kind of getting belligerent toward like other people that had come to see him. So, you know, that doesn't mean he's a fake, though. Yeah, it might be that you might have to work yourself up into some kind of weird psychotic frenzy to do this. We'll see. This is what I I see. This is the thing that's always kind of kind of mystified me about this case. How do you how do you fool these people that drunk consistently? Because 
from from what I heard, they never caught him. They never caught him slipping any, any, anything into the tube. Or did they? <laughs> did they? Okay, well... <laughs> Then you, you might have newer information or different information yeah. than I had. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, you, you can't base everything off of, like, the old Arthur C. Clarke show because that was a long yeah. time ago. Okay. But honestly, even that Arthur C. Clarke show had, like, two guys on there that said that they knew how he did it. Okay. Well, tell us more. So, but, yeah, but what I'm saying is that, so these long sessions would go on. He would ostensibly get drunker and drunker. Now... I remember, like, when I heard about this case as a kid, just like you did, um, I, th- I think, I don't know if they really, like, implied this on the show, but I somehow, I got the idea that every time they would take a picture, it would come out and it would be something. And that was not the case. Um, they said most of the time, I think of the tens of thousands of photographs that were produced over the three years that him and this uh, psychiatrist worked together... Um, 400 of them had images on them. So that's not a big, you know, percentage out of all the ones that were taken. Um, so a lot of the other ones, like I said, were just of his face, uh, as it would be if you just stuck the camera in your face and took a picture of it. Um, or there were some that were just all white or all black, which they called whiteies and blackies, which mm. I thought was very funny because <laughs> they just like said that on the show, just like. Okay, yeah. <laughs> if that's what you're calling them. But that's what they called them. Um, and I think that Eisenbud, he thought that those were paranormal also because he's like, oh, well, there's no way. They could be all white or all that black. That they could be all white or all black. And I'm like, mm, I'm not sure I agree with that, but okay. Um, you know what I mean? So he kind of counted those as paranormal photographs too. Now... Again, one of the things that bothers me about this, and there was a lot of video taken of these sessions, there were really no um, scientific controls uh, undertaken to the extent that, I mean, one video that I saw, there was three or four guys in the room, because sometimes they would let like a bunch of people come and they're just like, you know, bring a pack of Polaroid film and, you know, we'll load it up. Now, one thing, I don't think Ted Sirios ever held the camera himself. I'm not going to say never, but I, in all of the videos I saw, someone else was holding it. It was usually uh, Jewel Eisenberg was holding it or something like that. And then Ted would just kind of grab the lens and, you know, make faces and shit like that and do his thing to it. So he wasn't holding the camera. Okay. Um, not usually. But, so people would bring the film and everything, but... The way that Ted acted, like I said, he he would be drunk and sort of belligerent. He'd be kind of falling. He's like taking his shirt off and all this other stuff. So I feel like in the chaos, it would be very, very easy to fake this shit. Because it didn't look like anyone was trying particularly to keep him from faking anything. And I, and I definitely see, and I definitely feel like him engaging in all these shenanigans was very distracting for people. You know what I mean? Because there was like a bunch of people in the room and he was like running around the room or like, you know, on the floor doing whatever he was doing. And people was, there's guys over here, guys over there. Guys weren't even looking at him. Like no one was looking at him. You know what I mean? So I feel like it would have been very, very easy for him to fake things. Well, we don't know. We weren't there, though. No, but we I'm just, just saying, shared. no, from the yeah. video clips right. that I've seen, it doesn't really look like anyone was trying very hard to, you know, keep him from faking anything. Well, how do you fake it, though? Very easily. It's been uh, done okay, well, by guys. magicians. Okay. And honestly, somebody was um, telling me this, and I had forgotten all about these, but it used to be, you remember back in that, I think these were kind of big in the 80s, But there used to be, you could get them out of like quarter machines, like at fucking the mall or whatever. They were like these little, they were about this big, maybe a couple inches. And it was like a little plastic um, uh, case and there was like a lens in there. And then there was like a little bitty transparency, like in the back of the thing. And then you would look and it was, it was essentially like a little teeny like telescope. Hmm. And, And it had like a key ring, like a, it was like a key ring. And so you could look in there. And then there was like, it was like, Ooh, look, it's the Eiffel tower or whatever. I had, I had one that had like the leaning tower of Pisa in it or something like that. So 
you can make something like that like pretty easily and the fact that ted had always had to have this gizmo this little cardboard thing they said now that would have made it very easy to conceal because some of the magicians that have replicated this uh phenomena what they would do is they would take a little tube about an inch long about half an inch wide and you would cut out a piece of a 35 millimeter slide and you'd put a lens on one end and then you put the um you'd glue the little dot of the slide to the other end and it's all and it's really really small and you could actually fit it inside the paper but then you could palm it so when someone asked to see the paper you'd be like look see there's nothing in there but see it's it's so much smaller than the paper that you could just have it in between your fingers and nobody would see it so it's like it was super small and if you hold it up, because a lot of the pictures that Ted Sirius produced looked pretty much as though it, it's what it would look like if you held a little picture up like really close to the lens. It's like this little blurry picture with like dark edges, you know what I mean? Like are dark around the edges, just like if somebody had taken a picture of something out of a book or from so a slide so or a you, transparency and held it up really close to the camera. So if you have one of these little transparencies with a lens on it, you can hold it up to to a camera lens and, and get it yeah. into the thing? Oh, okay. It doesn't seem like it'd be possible. Yeah. Now, Maybe that's work. why okay. some of the pictures, well, most of the pictures actually were blurry because if you're mm -hmm. just, if you're not like taking the time to like really stick it in there, like you'll get an image, but it'll be blurry. Right. Uh, you know, and it'll you be can't really center. see what's happening because it's it's a still photograph, so it's not like you can line it up until it's perfect and then take the picture because you wouldn't know. Exactly. You just have to do it. It's just by chance. Yeah. And so I feel like that's probably, and as I said, when I've seen other magicians that have replicated this and other, like, other photographers that have replicated this, that's how they did it. And the tube that they used was so small that, like I said, you could easily ha just have it between your palms and your fingers, like in between your fingers and no one would see it. So was it. Ted ever caught with any of these little things? Um, I don't know if he was. Now, here's one thing, though. When these two guys were there, um, they asked him, like after a photo was produced and they pulled the, you know, Polaroid thing when you used to have to pull the paper off the front, then they waited and there was actually an image. And they said, hey, Ted, let's see that paper thing. And he stepped back and put his hand in his pocket as though he was like putting something in there. And then later he was like, oh, here, like uh -huh. handing them the paper. So he did like sketchy shit like that. Okay. And as I said, the fact that, you know, I'm not saying that that's how he did it, but it just seems to me that so many people have been able to replicate this using very simple means very and very um and especially like i said the videos that i've seen of him um you know no one is attempting to keep him from doing that there's yeah. nobody they're like no you can't use that no you can't the, you know nobody tied his hands to the table or nothing like that it's just he's pretty much allowed to do what he wants and he's running around taking off his clothes and yelling and whatever it is he's doing acting like a crazy person and then he's, you know, he's up there making all his crazy faces in front of the camera and bam and all that yeah. other kind of stuff. So he could be, have this little tube. He could have it anywhere. You know what I mean? He could have it in his mouth. He could have it in his, who fucking knows where it is. It's, it's really small. Like the ones that have been used. So I'm just saying, you know, whether or not he did it like, but the fact that you can do that and produce something that looks pretty much exactly like the photos that he produced, um, gives me pause. Okay. Now, the only thing that sort of argues against that, and I'm not saying that there's not an explanation for this, but some of the photos that were produced were, I mean, a lot of them were buildings. Um, you know, some of them were cars, some of them were like, you know, it usually wasn't people. I mean, some of them, yeah. they couldn't really tell what they were because they were like all blurry and fucked up looking. Right. But one of the photographs, interestingly, appeared to be the outside of Dr. Eisenbud's ranch, but it looked kind of different than the ranch looked in real life. You know what I mean? Like the window yeah. configuration was kind of different. So I don't know if, 
if that was actually a picture of his house or if it was a picture that he found of a house that was similar. Um, you know, so I, I don't really know how that worked out. I remember out. there was one of them that was produced. It was a picture of a biplane and it looks pretty normal. Yeah. But somebody pointed out that the struts that hold the top wing to the bottom wing were, were opposite. They were, the yeah. design was wrong for that airplane. Yeah. You know, unless maybe it was a photograph he found of a prototype version of that plane that where, where That's the what struts I'm might have been a little bit different. You know? Yeah, because... Maybe, maybe there was a limited edition version of that plane, and it, people didn't really know about it. Because it was yeah. a World War One plane, if I remember correctly. Yeah. But uh, Yeah, know, I remember seeing that one. Yeah, and things changed very quickly in World War One aviation. You know, every month they made some kind of a change to an airplane somewhere. And maybe, maybe there was, maybe that plane existed in a limited edition that something was backwards on it for a little while. Yeah. But uh, it was weird, you know, some of the stuff they said. Now, one of the photos I remember that they, they identified was, Ted said it was uh, a caveman. Yeah. And they looked oh, at Oh, I know which one you're talking yeah, they about. I have a picture it. of that, too. They looked at it and it was uh, some, it was a photograph of a uh, of something from a museum, from a museum museum yeah, of national, his, natural, natural history natural history it was like a Australopithecus or yeah Homo erectus or yeah something. and I have a picture of that too yeah so that's what I mean so the only thing that gives me pause about it like I said and there, and actually then the other example of this that I was thinking of was there was this one that looked like they figured out that it was a picture of an airplane hangar. Um, that belonged to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. But in the picture, which was blurry, it looked as though Canadian was misspelled. Yeah, like, that's right. I remember that. Weird. Which. Remember. That's weird. It is. That, that's pretty weird. But the it's blurry, though. So I can't really tell if it's actually misspelled or if it's just blurry. And it looks just these like. Weird, they're just weird anomalies. Remember I was telling you about the cat. The cat vision, how the cat yeah. saw the human like it had ears. Yeah. It's almost kind of like maybe if he was projecting his thought onto a film, it was his version of it. Or and his he perception. didn't know how to spell Canadian. And Canadian was misspelled <laughs> in his version. Or maybe it was just done quickly by the subconscious. And the subconscious well, may I not think have the that, skills, you know. I think that's what Dr. Eisenbud was arguing. Yeah. Was that, because I mean, uh, Jewel Eisenbud was like his big like advocate and he kind of took them all over the place and he did like, like, like I said, like all these fucking thousands of photos and all these sessions with him and ended up writing a book about him in 1967 called The World of Ted Sirius. Um, but, you know, as I said, after their three year thing, but I think that was that was kind of what Dr. Eisenberg was proposing was that these images were coming out of like a sort of a dreamlike uh, yeah. state where it wasn't as Ted was really perceiving them, that, but they that... were either like being channeled through him, which I think Ted Sirius kind of implied that, um, or that he was remembering them incorrectly. Or it was a manifestation of, or, or, or a, a, a manifestation of the work of a certain kind of a subconscious faculty yeah. within him. You know what I mean? We have many different facets to our personality. Maybe that, you know what I mean? Right and left hemispheres and, Maybe just some kind of a an area of his brain that just handled visual stuff. You know what I mean? Visual uh, information, but not really spelling. Yeah. You know? Where he kind of knew in general what the word Canadian looked like, but not close enough to know how it was spelled. Yeah. Just the shape of that it's, word. It's weird, kinda. though, because I found, like, I found it interesting that so many of the photos that were produced, or at least the ones that I've seen... Um, and I think all of them are at the University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore campus. They were all uh, given to the collection there. So I think you can, I don't know if it's open to the public, but I thought you could go and see them. Because um, I saw this lecture by this parapsychologist. Uh, I think his name was Richard Brody, Brody, something like that. And he is like a big advocate of Ted Sirius' work. And he um, either worked at the University of Maryland or whatever. So he's like seen all the photos. And he thinks he's legit and he thinks he's the real thing. Um, and he thinks that he had like a this really powerful like psychokinetic um, power. But, I, you know, I don't know. It's it, To me, it just seems like it's something that's too easily faked. 
Um, and it, you know, it should be said in 1967, which was the same year that, uh, the book about Ted Sirius came out that Jewel Eisenbutt had written, um, these two guys named Charlie Reynolds and David Eisendrath, they were, um, they worked for popular photography magazine and they were also both magicians. So they, um, arranged to spend a weekend with Ted Sirios and Jewel Eisenbud to see if they could figure out what it was that he was doing. And they said that they saw Ted Sirios putting that little tube, the little tube into the paper tube and then like not letting them check out what it was. You know what I mean? Yeah. So step something into the tube. Huh? So yeah. So they actually, it's interesting because they wrote an article about it saying, oh, you know, if he was doing it, this is what he was doing, and they explained the whole like tube contraption and everything. And pretty much after that article came out, um, Ted Sirius's career was pretty much over um, because, every, you know, people were just like, oh, well, that's how he did it. It was just a trick, um, and that was pretty much all she wrote. Now they did have a reunion though recently. Yeah, oh, he's dead now though. Ted yeah. Sirius, he died in two thousand six, I think. Okay, well before he died, he got together with that guy. Yeah, he did. They yeah, they had, have, had a they had a tried to have another session. I watched it. They couldn't produce anything, uh -uh. which I thought that was odd. I thought that if that guy could fake it, he would at least fake it again once. Yeah, unless but he just thought fuck it. Maybe he thought like, well, if I don't do it, they'll think it was real. Yeah, maybe he was thinking that. Yeah. Because, he, you know, he, he said, well, maybe I lost it. I guess I lost it, you know. But he looked like he was trying to do it. Yeah. And he, he evidently didn't drink as much as he used to. Yeah, because that dude looked like... I mean, yeah. it's just funny. Like, I guess not funny because it's like alcoholism. But, you know, you see, like, videos of sessions with this guy. And there's some of them on YouTube. I'll probably put one yeah, of them in trashed. the video, too. And it's just like, he's just like taking a whole bottle. He's not even a glass or nothing. No, a it's just like, he just takes the whole bottle and can swigs. And then, you know what I mean? I'm surprised he's still standing up, man. Because yeah. I mean, even when he first kind of came to the attention of the paranormal world, he was already in his 40s by then. So he wasn't a young yeah. guy. So I don't know how long he had been doing that. Yeah. And I, from, I hadn't seen him in a long time, but I remember him having kind of like a fucking old greaser haircut. Look like a little greaser. He did kind of, yeah. yeah. Oh, duck bill, fucking duck ass haircut in the back like fucking Elvis and shit. Yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't quite that extreme, but yeah. yeah. I see what you're getting at. Kind of rednecky. Did... Kind of like a redneck. Yeah. yeah. He definitely did come off like that. He's yeah. he was he seemed very he <sighs> like old school redneck, old school redneck. Or like you know what he reminded me he reminded me a little bit of you know those kind of yeah those like fifties like greaser. teen gang movies yeah, yeah. where all where all the people in the teen gang like were greaser, fifty yeah. years old. Yeah. <laughs> he reminded me of that type of dude. He's just like this little wiry yeah, kind skinny. of skinny. Yeah, yeah, with the, with all these like crazy like fucking facial expressions yeah. and stuff He's like that. He just like reminded me of that. Well So so after this article came out um, about this particular, and these photographers and magicians said, oh, you know, he just has like this little thing with a lens on it and then like a little, you know, you, you can make it yourself. It's very easy. It's like you just cut out a little piece of a photographic slide or whatever, and you just kind of stick it on that and you stick it inside the thing and no one can see it. And, you know, you push it up to the thing and it makes a image. And I've seen other, like other images that are you know, that people have said that they made mm -hmm. it with that method and they look pretty much exactly the same. Um, you know, they're dark around the edges. They're kind of smudgy because you didn't get them quite right. So I, I just kind of feel like that's probably what he did. Okay. Um, so you're going to say probably a fake. I'm yeah. going to say maybe it happened, but probably not. I, I, yeah. think, it's, I think it's an interesting case. It is. He, he, he was like an interesting dude. Yeah. And for a while, it seemed like he was kind of on all these paranormal shows, and it was just like, he, and he seemed like such a character because of all the drinking and all the crazy yeah. faces, and he like acted like a psycho all the time. <laughs> like who knows? These... It might have been a mixture of faking and some of it kind of real, because some of the anomalies in those photographs are kind of odd, unless he would, had the foresight to go out and find anomalous photographs. And get you know get the negatives of those. 
Yeah. Something that would just really impress people when they saw it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Ca- like Canadian misspelled on a damn Canadian Air Force building. You know, yeah. I just find it odd. It's suspicious. I, it, Although that might, I'm be- not going to just totally discount it. That yeah. might even that might not have even like been a photograph. Maybe he, maybe it was just like an illustration from a magazine, and somebody didn't like maybe. spelled it wrong or something like that. Maybe we don't know. Because I seen it. well, because I feel like some of the images that I have seen, because a lot of them are online now, because like I said, that mm-hmm. the whole collection went to the University of uh, Maryland. Some of the images that were produced look like they have um, dot like a dot matrix on them as though yeah. he got them out of a newspaper. Out of a newspaper, right. And now I should say too, that I think, um, there was another magician, uh, later on who said that they had seen Ted Sirius and he had a marble that had a picture like stuck to it inside the marble and a marble yeah or like like on the back of the marble or something like that and then he caught it and then he caught him with that Hmm. so i guess so that would work too i guess you wouldn't even necessarily need a lens i guess you would just if you had like a clear marble you could kind Hmm. of stick a photo on the back of it and then as long as you kind of pushed it into the lens it would give you kind of a creepy looking photo hmm it's funny because some of the some of the photos that he took that didn't really look like anything because some of them they were like ooh look creepy and I'm like that just looks like the inside of your nose or whatever but um, there was a couple that you can really tell what they were and one of them he tried to say was um, Ganymede like yeah it's one of the moons of Jupiter right and I'm just like okay. <laughs> <laughs> And he was, he said he regretted that he couldn't get any like astronomers or anything to get like on board with that. I'm like, yeah, I wonder why, I wonder why he couldn't. What'd the picture look like? Nothing. It okay. just, it, it, it didn't look like anything. It, so you it, couldn't tell it what it was. It looked like when my camera goes off inside my purse, <laughs> it kind of looked like that. You know what I mean? Okay. So yeah, it, it's, that's the thing. It's like, I could take one of the pictures that, to, that it, my phone takes inside my purse when it fucking stays on and I touch it or something yeah. like that. And then that's Ganymede. Yeah, no, I, we'll see. I would be yeah. smart. I would yeah. say it was from like some undiscovered planet. Okay. I'm not going to say it's something that we can actually see with the Hubble Space Telescope. Mm. I'm not an idiot, you know. I'm just going to so they, yeah. I, I, you know, keep it so they can't prove it. That's what you got to do. Okay. All right. Anything else on Ted? <laughs> anything else on Ted? I was going to say that I always wondered why um, so many of the photos that he produced were buildings i guess he was maybe he was just into that so like he'd go to the library and he's like oh i like that building and i like that building and he just like cut could out be there was e- could be that it's easy to find i suppose they were, they were easy to find uh those photos maybe i don't know yeah because you wouldn't like i said you wouldn't necessarily have to use a slide although that would probably be the easiest if you thing. use the photograph of or a, you could use a negative if you use the photograph of a person it would be too easy to track down to where, track down where it where was you got that that's person. yeah oh yeah that's a good point because if right. you use buildings like i said if right. you use a, say a picture of like the fucking you know saint paul's cathedral or been there forever leaning tower of pisa there's like a million pictures of that right so you know it'd be it, hard to place it in time it would be harder and it would be harder to go this exact photograph right. the same because so many people have taken right. photographs of it so yeah you're you got a point there because i was sitting there wondering it's like did he just really like buildings or why it's like you know it, it just seemed kind of weird like he t- he had a picture of one that was like a hilton hotel and like some other city or I, don't right. know. I think he was in Denver and there was like a picture of the Hilton from Chicago, like where he lived or something like that. But, uh, yeah. So honestly, like I said, I'm not going to say a hundred percent that he was faking, but the fact that it would be so easy to fake the fact that so many magicians have done, done it like that. And the photos look pretty much exactly the same. I kind of feel like, that's probably what he was doing. And I, I I just don't think he, because of all the drinking, because of all the chaos that ensued when they would do these sessions, I just don't think anyone was paying that close attention to him. Okay. You know what I mean? I just so think he was he, using it as a diversionary tactic. You get drunk yeah. and, you, and you, you make him diversions. Yeah. Okay. And well, like I said, I think the tube that he was using or the marble or whatever yeah. was like so small yeah. It's like it would be super easy to just like stick it in your pocket or like roll it under a table or under the dresser or something like that. No one would see it. You I'll could just... have you could have a couple of them prepared for the night, and then after you did those ones, you could just be like, "Oh, I'm done now," and then like all the other ones wouldn't have to be anything. I'm gonna say it's an interesting case. 
<laughs> I'm just I was going to say it's an interesting case. <laughs> I'd like to see it again. I'd like to see, yeah, it's been a long time since I've seen the photographs and everything, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I've got some of them. I'll put them. Uh, okay. I'll put them on the YouTube show if you guys want to see them. Like I said, all there's right. there's tons of them all over the place. You can see them there. Okay. I don't know if they had because for a while they had a whole website when they had the exhibition up at the University of Maryland, and I think they had almost all the photographs on there. Like I said, I think it was about 400 uh, photographs, but I don't know if it's all on there anymore. The yeah. The link is broken. But um, I did find quite a few of the photographs, and I found the caveman one, and you know, I think I found one yeah. of that Canadian thing and stuff like that. All right, so we're going to take a break right now. When we get back, I want to talk a little bit about... Um, kind of the history of photography, um, and you know where the idea of it came from, and like maybe go into like some of the other people that did yeah, it. Yeah, because there's some interesting stuff about Yuri Geller too. I yeah, mean, I think he was mostly a magician. But when well, he started some, out as a magician, yeah, but there are some feats that he did was pretty weird. But you know, then again, magicians could do weird shit. That's what, see, yeah. that's why I'm sorry, always sorry really, know. really skeptical about all right. these, like, psychics with these powers and stuff like that. I'm like, if a magician can do it, right? then I, I don't think you can do it. Well, okay, we'll talk about it. Uh, <laughs> all right, so let's take a break. We will be back in just a few minutes. The Faceless Villain, a collection of the eeriest unsolved murders of the 20th century, volume two, includes cases spanning the years from 1960 through 1979 featuring such infamous crimes as the triple homicide at Lake Bodum, the family massacre known as the Good Heart Murders, the serial killings of the Zodiac, Bible John, Jack the Stripper, and the Freeway Phantom, the slaughter of dozens of women and girls along the Highway of Tears and the Texas Killing Fields, and the mysterious death of suspected spy, the Isdal Woman, along with dozens of other fascinating and horrifying accounts. Buy it now from Amazon in print, Kindle, or audiobook format. See, when you're doing laundry, she jumps in there. What you doing? What you doing, boogie? What you doing? You like, don't take it. Don't take it. <laughs> no, Look it's my pile. It's my pile. <laughs> don't take it. <laughs> yeah? Don't take it. Oh. Don't take it. <laughs> That's what she does. Yeah. Every time we pour out the laundry, she runs underneath it. <laughs> And then gets mad and tries you to keep you like, keep him from taking the pieces. Like, no, that's my favorite. She's no. like, don't take it. We are back talking about photography. Yeah, and Jenny got me bummed out over fucking serious. Are you thinking. bummed out? I thought I thought that dude probably did, actually did that shit, but I'm thinking about it. Nah, he probably faked it. He well, like I said, it. I'm not saying definitively because I wasn't there. I'm just saying it would be really, really easy to you do. Ru you ruined my childhood. You ruined my childhood. Ain't that some shit? Sorry. <laughs> No, not right. really. No, it's all right. <laughs> you got to face the truth when it's time to face the truth. You know what I mean? But, That's what I do, man. But I don't I think ruin that dude, people's childhood. Yeah, I don't think that dude. <laughs> I don't think that dude did that. You yeah. Know I mean? Even though I don't really like the Amazing Randy too much, but I respect his game. You know what I mean? If he, if mm -hmm. he, uh, if he, if he could replicate it, then that's probably what happened. Yeah, and it wasn't just him. Like I said, other yeah. other magicians have replicated it also. Right. But so, like I said, now, photography as a concept uh, predated Ted Serious by quite a long way. Um, the first uh, known kind of mention of it in the literature actually came from 1896. And it was a book called The New Photography, because <laughs> it was a newfangled shit back then. Yeah, right. <laughs> Photographs, oh my God, right. you're capturing my soul. By uh, Arthur Brunel Chatwood. Now, it wasn't called photography uh, at the time. That term was coined a little bit later. But he actually, in this book, he talks about exper experiments where 
it's like some like shit that you saw or like objects that you saw with like the retina of your eye would like make such an impression on you that if you looked at this object and it made a super big impression on you, then you looked at like a light sensitive plate, you could like yeah okay I, I, I got you yeah. yeah so like I said that was kind well, of he, what Tesla was saying well that too, makes sense bit. you know why if you look at the sun for too long. All right, and then you it look burns, away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could, it's, so that's what they're talking about. Yeah, it's not as stupid you, as it sounds. Right. <laughs> like when, I was a kid, when I was a kid, you know, we used to play around with that kind of shit, staring yeah. at something, you know, for a long time, and then going into a dark room and looking, and you can kind of see the. And you see like a negative of it, negative yeah. of it against the wall, yeah. It, yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's what they're talking about. So yeah, so it's not as like stupid right. as it sounds because it does seem like. That maybe you shit's that. going into your eye and then mm. you're like projecting it back out mm -hmm. because i do feel like they kind of you know maybe by then that concept was sort of on the way out but i do feel like they were thinking oh shit's like going in your eye and then shit's coming out of your right. eye like to see you know what i mean so i feel like there was some of that going on so that's like i said that's going back to 1896 and wasn't there a thing too i feel like I don't even remember what it was, but I feel like it was maybe some movie about Jack the Ripper or something like that, where they mentioned, oh, well, if we take a, you know, take a photograph or take like a photographic plate of her retina of her eyeball, maybe we'll see then him, we'll right. see the murderer. Because right. I think there was like some kind of weird urban legend about how right. murder victims like would imprint like a, yeah. like the last thing they saw before they died, like it'd be stuck on their eyeball or something. Imagine, imagine the Ripper was at home lo losing sleep over that. Oh, they'll probably look into her retina and see oh, me. Fuck. Oh, shit. Yeah, he's tossed. I didn't turn. even think about they're that. They're coming in on I should have worn a mask. Oh, shit. Yeah. They're, they're going to catch me any day. <laughs> Isn't that kind of funny? Yeah. I like to think about that. And nowadays, we're just like, it's it's fine, dude. Yeah. That, that's not how it works. But, um, yeah, so I feel like I've seen some, some shit where they thought that. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I've seen some fucking movies, maybe even like from the 40s and 50s, that still had that concept. Right. Of you know oh the last well, there's thing a guy the now sees. there's a guy now he was in one of these in one of those band TED talks and he was uh, one of the guys that hangs out with who's the dude that does all the uh, the the Egyptian um, stuff Graham Hancock he's one of Graham Hancock's friends oh yeah yeah, yeah. I know who you're talking about one of Graham Hancock's friends had an alternate theory that maybe vision does come out of your eye oh yeah 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 I and know who you're talking about yeah, they banned it they banned that shit because. But it kind of, he was saying that it kind of made sense, though, because that might ex explain the Heisenberg uncertainty principles and other uncertainty principles about objects aren't affected until you look at them. Yeah. So he said that maybe there is an alternate, or it's a two-way thing. Yeah, light does enter, but also your consciousness envelops the object that, yeah. you know what I mean? So anyway, that's, that's his theory. It's but, like, I don't know. It's like, I kind of, I think I kind of heard part of that, that Ted talk and it kind of yeah. sounded dumb as hell, but I'm not really sure, you know, I'm, well, I'm not an optics expert. Well, he obviously. was, <laughs> he wasn't saying that there would be, you know, he wasn't putting forth any kind of evidence. It was all just a theory. Right. That maybe it was a two way street. You had light coming in, but you also had consciousness coming out. Coming out. Yeah. And that, that kind of. Not like interacted. laser eyes. It's but, like, yeah. No. That your consciousness kind of enveloped things through through a process of vision, and you know he he you know he, well you guys can watch the TED talk for yourself. It's out there. Yeah, it's it's floating around out there. It, I've seen kind of, it, it's, so it's not like it's. Hard yeah, to find and now him and Graham Hancock are also talking about you know highly psychedelic drugs like ayahuasca, you know. But so is Joe Rogan and altered states of consciousness are real. They really do. That really does well, happen. Obviously. Those, those things really do affect Otherwise, you. Otherwise, people wouldn't take drugs. <laughs> yeah. And there have been a lot of people who have actually come up with awesome songs and artworks and inventions in altered states of consciousness. Uh, some people are saying that these guys on Silicon Valley, up in Silicon Valley, are microdosing LSD. Well, that's a big thing, yeah. And that just small doses of LSD can keep, keep creativity going. And if you've ever fucked with any of that, people, we've never fucked with that. We, we have never no, fucked with we, No, I never, would never do such that a thing. There may be something to that. <laughs> there may be something to that because... Uh, well, I could see that, sure. Yeah, because you can think kind of sideways under these weird drugs and come up with some weird solution to a problem that you, you know, maybe, maybe a solution to a problem you hadn't envisioned yet. Just weird shit like that. Yeah. But, well, you, but it's not just that alone. You, you also have to be... 
a trained physicist or a trained, you know what I mean? You have to have other skills. Well, anything that is going to get you, like you said, thinking along a different line than you normally would. Right. Because I feel like most people in their everyday lives, you know, your your thought gets kind of placed along yeah. railroad tracks. Because it kind of has to be, you know, you got to do the same thing every day, like routine and everything. You're not used to like branching out in all these different directions. So you can see why people take psychedelics. All you got to do is look at the Mexicans and the, the uh, Mesoamericans, you know, the Incans, Mayans, the Aztecs, the Toltecs and all those they were into all that. They took all those weird ass drugs and they had technology, technology that people don't realize that they had. I mean, they were kind of with calendars, super advanced calendars, super advanced thinking. Now, a lot of their stuff was destroyed, but the Spanish of the time, even some of the, uh, the, uh, the friars and the monks that the, that, the, that the church sent down there, they were up in arms about destroying that stuff. They were saying, this is valuable, you yeah. know? technology and information that these guys had thousands of years yeah. of research and work on philosophy and calendars and shit like that you know and that came from all that stuff basically well, yeah. fucking around with them damn drugs like i said i think that is probably the best thing about psychedelics and other drugs of that ilk is that they uh, they almost force your brain to make connections that it wouldn't make otherwise. Yeah. Because like I said, you, you get into, everybody gets into patterns with their thinking, especially, you know, the older you get, you can get kind of set in your ways. You get used to doing things in a particular way. So I think it's very useful to take something that will, you know, cause synapses to fire that wouldn't yeah. necessarily like, or we're in a different order. It makes right. connections that you wouldn't necessarily yeah, make. Yeah, if you take a dumb motherfucker and you give him that kind of stuff, he just does silly shit, okay? <laughs> but if you, if you take a, a genius, and a genius who can't solve a certain problem, you've been working on it forever, and you give him that, there's a chance that that might help him find that. Find well, it's just like how... It's a very imagination-based, Yeah. You know? Well, it's just like how sometimes, and I've had this happen to me as well, that, you know, you kind of run into a problem, especially if it's like a creative problem. Like, say I'm writing a novel and I'm like at some plot point and I can't figure it out or whatever. And then you'll be like stressing out about it, but then you have a dream. Right. And it like sorts it out for you and you're just like, oh, yeah, duh. Yeah, Einstein said that he would see things in little micro dreams. Yeah. He'd be napping a little bit and he'd go, oh, that's what it is. And then he'd go and figure it out. Yeah. So altered states of consciousness are actually do help because your waking consciousness is actually pretty weak compared to all the other subroutines and stuff going on inside the subconscious. That's well, yeah, doing there's all the, a lot of shit that's going on. That's behind. doing all the heavy lifting, and that's what you have to access. And that's what uh, transcendental meditation, hardcore sensory deprivation, weird shit like that, and then some of these psychedelics are kind of shortcuts to it. Yeah, exactly. To that same... Like I said, which is why I think they're very useful. Right. But, yeah, so... So the whole photography thing, like I said, it came from the idea that you could somehow project your thoughts or project something that you had seen onto a light sensitive plate, which like I said, it doesn't, it sounds kind of crazy, but not if you think about it in the context of the time. And even if you think about it in the context of now, it doesn't really sound all that weird because... You know, look at, we have MRIs. We can, like, yeah. look inside people's bodies. You can look inside people's brains, see their brain waves and shit like that. So I don't think it's that nutty. But the term photography actually comes from uh, Japan. I think it was first coined in 1913. And this was a guy named uh, Tomokichi Fukurai. And he was probably the first guy to, like, work on this photography thing, like, as the the kind of like main thrust of his research. Something that I didn't realize until I was researching this show was that you guys, you know the movie The Ring that came out in 2002? It's a remake of the Japanese movie Ringu. And I've seen that one as well, but I can't remember if this was an aspect of the original Japanese film or not, but I know it was in the American remake where the early days of photography in Japan, that's kind of loosely where the inspiration for the ring came from because the little girl that comes out of the TV and kills people and whatnot, she um, thought these horrible images onto the cursed video. That's how they got there. She didn't record them or anything. It just, it came out of her brain. It came out of her subconscious. And then when people watched the video, 
you know, then she comes and gets them, like, they'll die seven days later, and then the curse is passed along and shit like that. So there's kind of, like, scenes where they show this little girl and she, they're kind of researching her because she can do this kind of shit. So I was like, I didn't even realize that until I was like reading about it because I fucking love that movie. It scared the shit out of me when I saw it the first time. I've never seen it. You've never seen the ring. Mm. Oh, it's so good. It's mm. so good. You got to see it. I saw it in the theater when it came out. Like I said, it came out in 2002 and I saw the original later and I liked it, but I, this is a, one of the cases where, uh, the American remake, I think, was actually better than the Asian original, which right. is usually not the case. Yeah. But I think in this case, uh, it really was. Like, yeah, the, got, the video got, of it was so creepy and shit. I got so many Japanese ones that I'm behind on that I ha- that I have to see. I still haven't seen Tetsuya Tetsu, Iron Man. That's on Shudder. We yeah, I know. Everybody tells me to see days. that one. I haven't seen it yet. I've seen it, but it was a long time ago. You yeah. should also see Old Boy. Oh boy, I saw parts of it. That is also on yeah. uh, Shutter. I saw like the first one third of it, and I forgot what happened. I think I got interrupted. Never yeah. finished it. Yeah. But re- for he really, he was trying to figure out where he was based on the damn uh, pot sticker noodles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That they were getting. You, you definitely call Yakimandu. It was a Korean movie, wasn't it? Because he was he was talking about Yakim 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 yeah. Yakimandu. This was Korean noodle pot sticker noodle. Yeah. What do they call them? Dumplings. Yeah. Dumplings. I love them. Another one you should see, which is actually, uh, I think it's actually Chinese, but you yeah. should see one called The Eye. Okay. Do not see the American remake. It is an abortion. <laughs> but the original is actually really, really good. But you should see The Ring. The American remake, Naomi Watts was in it. Um, it was in Mulholland Drive, which is, if you've done movie, watch our movie retrospective, you know it's like one of my favorite movies ever. But she was in The Ring. And it, I saw it in the theater, and it for real scared the crap out of me. <laughs> and that's saying something, because I love horror movies, and they don't usually bother me. But that one creeped me the fuck out. I don't know why. There was something about that video, like the video images. It was like, it was just like super creepy. But yeah, that was based on the autography because the little girl had projected these creepy images onto this videotape that subsequently went on to kill people. So let's talk a little bit about, so Tomokichi Fukurai, um, he started kind of looking into this whole photography thing and he started working with um, a bunch of women in Japan that were mediums that claimed they could do this type of stuff that they could project their thoughts onto film so interestingly uh he had one called uh chizuko mifune and then he had one called ikuko nagao and she was the main one that he worked with that said she could like tell telepathically imprint images onto photo plates now this you know like i said he called it photography which he actually called it Nensho, which I guess sort of sort of translates to spirit photography, even though, like I said, spirit photography in English, that's not really the same thing, because that's usually like that Victorian thing where they put ghosts right, in yeah. the fucking photos. But so that's what they called it over there. It was like Nensho or Nentography or something like that. I think now, the Japanese word for ghost, spirit and psychic and all that stuff is probably all kind of rolled into one thing. Yeah. Probably just means, you know, paranormal photo. Probably just be paranormal. Ghost shit. Yeah, paranormal shit. <laughs> but yeah, the thing is, so he had done like all of these similar type of things to, you know, Ted Sirio's type things where she's like, ooh, look at all these creepy photos uh, that she produced. But apparently some journalists or whatever came to investigate, thought that it, it was fraudulent or thought that they caught them in a lie or something like that. And the girl... Uh, the woman, Ikuko Nagao, she actually ended up dying later, like pretty young, from... Now, I've seen illness, I've seen suicide. Probably suicide. So, yeah, so I don't know yeah. if, like, some, some people said, oh, she got some horrible illness because of all the stress because she got accused of being a fraud or whatever. If it's Japan, probably suicide. Or she may be off herself, I'm not really yeah. sure. Now, so even though uh, Fukurai actually published a book about the phenomena in 1913, which I think is where the term photography comes from. Um, But it kind of got raked over the coals by the scientific community at the time who just said that, you know, lack of controls, he didn't do the test right, blah, blah, blah. And he was kind of, he worked for a university at the time, but he kind of got shit on and he ended up having to quit like later that year. So that whole thing happened there. Um, And as I said before, when when I was talking about the movie The Ring, they actually coined the term projected thermography. Okay. Uh, but they, they, I believe they coined that for that movie. 
but they but the paranormal uh, community has kind of taken that term on so thoughtography and projected thermography are now interchangeable uh terms even though i'm pretty sure that that's that that came from the movie so there was also now i think this is particularly where the thing for the ring came from because one of uh Fukurai's other uh subjects was named Sadako Takahashi. Now I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, but the girl in the ring was called Sadako. I thought she was. So I think that's kind of where that's where that came from as well. Now let's talk a little bit about um yeah, so Fukurai, he he died in the fifties, but he established a like a paranormal uh, you know, institute or whatever. So that's so he's kind of like the father of photography, I guess. So let's talk a little bit about this other medium. And her name was Eva Carrier. Now she was another one that sort of did a photography type mm. thing. Although what she did was kind of more in line with your classic seance type uh, manifestations. What she would do is she would produce ectoplasm, but the ectoplasm would have pictures of people in it. Didn't come from her vag, did it? Um... <laughs> <laughs> remember how, remember how that well shit, you got to understand something, folks. Ectoplasm, if you really look into the record, a lot of times ectoplasm came from the vag. Well, because that's the that's really you good place it. to hide it. Yeah. There's right. a lot of room in there. Yeah, there's <laughs> witnesses would say, you know, there was a very bodily kind of smell. <laughs> kind of like, you know what I mean? Very feminine kind of a smell. Yeah. You know, it's just, you know, mm. it's weird about how, you know, we don't know why it happens, but it just does. Yeah, it's like I wonder. I really wonder why does ectoplasm always smell like my wife's cooch? Pull it out, <laughs> pull it out of the snatch, photos and all. <laughs> yeah. Actually, the photos that I've seen of Eva Carrier, uh, she usually had the ectoplasm coming out of her mouth or out of the sides of her, side of her head or something like that. But one of the best. Here, well, here's the thing about a lot of these mediums, and especially if you, I mean, if you're doing this shit, because some of the tricks they pulled were pretty elaborate, right? So if you're doing that shit, I can see why it's like, you know, we can't have any lights on in the room. It's like no photographers, no skeptics, yeah. nothing like that. I've, so seen we, photog I've seen photographs of it. Well, though. I know, but yeah. so she was dumb enough to be like, sure, you can take photographs. It looks okay. fake as fuck. Yeah. So one photograph, yeah. a very famous one of her, that was taken... Um, because I guess she, what she would do is she was producing the ectoplasm and it had like people's faces in it. She would say like, yeah. they're ghost faces. I'm producing them from my body or whatever. Yeah. Now, someone took a picture of her from the opposite side, like from where the face was appearing and where the face was, you could clearly see that she had cut someone's fa <laughs> picture of someone's face out of a magazine Yeah, <laughs> because she could see like. The yeah. text and shit, text like, on the yeah. back of the picture. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, pretty, it's, it's just, lame. like, stuck on the side of her head. I don't know where these mediums got the idea for ectoplasm. I mean... See, now, I, I feel like we discussed that on some other show, but it's just, like, this is so intriguing to me. Why would I remember, you come up with that? Yeah, like, I remember, because I was super into, like, yeah. paranormal shit when I was a right. kid, and I'd for, be like, why? For any new listeners, I've had a paranormal experience. Jenny's had a paranormal experience with me, too. But poltergeist, and uh, which is a long time ago when I was a kid, my whole family. Anyway, I never saw anything like ectoplasm. The closest thing to ectoplasm I ever saw was that blue haze. Yeah. The, the blue haze and kind of weird kind of halo type things around objects that were getting ready to move. But, but the, it, it was hard to tell if it was really there or not. You couldn't look directly at it. Yeah. It was almost kind of like you were definitely looking at a some kind of a, an anomaly. It wasn't solid, you know. You're definitely looking at something in the realm of the fucking physics. Energy or quantum something, you know. I, who am I to, you know, I can't put words to any of this kind of shit. It's just, but when you see photographs of ectoplasm from these seances, that's obviously cotton. Or cheesecloth. Or cheesecloth. With cut out little photographs of people laid on them. Yeah, and, you know. I mean, when you take a picture of, of it with a flash, that's it's very obviously obvious what, that it that's is. what it is. When I first saw that, I first saw that as a kid, but it was after the Mammoth Mountain thing went down. Yeah. And then I looked at that, and I almost believed it. I was like, "Wow," you know what I mean? But then I was going, 
no, that can't be. That can't be. I didn't ever saw anything like that. But it was, it was weird looking. Well, yeah, the but pictures. That's what I mean. And it was the, weird it was looking. the same kind of thing about all the seance photos and you yeah. know the ghost photos that I saw at that museum exhibition. It's like even if you know they're fake, yeah. they're still yeah weird pictures. Yeah, I'm that like, are like creepy looking. I'm like 14, 15, 16 running across these photographs after after seeing that thing when I was thirteen. You know, and and I'm almost entertaining it for a second. Yeah, and I'm going, no, it can't be. I mean, because I was looking for what happened to me and my family over and over again in the right. record. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just weird, you know. And you you just can't you can't photograph you can't photograph things like ectoplasm and expect people to fucking believe it when it's made out of fucking cheesecloth and shit. Yeah, because the closest it's... thing to anything that me and my family ever saw was people taking photographs of little things sitting on steps and little objects sitting on things, and you know what I mean? Yeah. Because that's what a poltergeist. Did event looks like when you try to photograph it you know a rocking chair upside down yeah you know that's it see i always kind of wondered though like you said is like where did the concept of ectoplasm originate from like i think what like, happened okay was, I think, I'm, I'm trying to project myself back in time i am yeah. a fraudulent medium let's say that right that's what and, i was thinking and i want to do like I, a seance i'm going to do something that nobody's done before so everybody right. will come to mind and give me money why, why this though? why that yeah why would you think of that oh i'm going to take a piece of cheesecloth and, and put, put pictures in it and, and stick it up my cooch yeah and then pull it out and be like oh it's look at that right. so it's ghost snot coming from my right. body what the fuck it's like why would you even think of that and then um i remember this, acid that's what it was this a long time ago <laughs> i read people who giving their accounts of what happened in a seance and they believed it 100 percent that the whole thing was spiritual and paranormal but they also said they could tell there was a lot of sexual energy in the air and that you know what i mean that the medium was basically showing her cooch off or you know what I mean? And Maybe it, that's why everybody was going. It was like yeah, cheap. It was like porn. Yeah, yeah. And that they could swear that masturbation, that she, she sounded like she'd had an orgasm, that maybe yeah. she was masturbating. Well, that might explain it. Then. And yeah, and these are people from, you know, the 1800s, early 1900s. Yeah, they, and, did, they and, didn't have internet porn. And for some reason, They didn't though, even have Hustler. For some reason, though, this is adding more credibility to yeah. the seance, which I don't really understand that. Well, I guess because, it was a sheltered time. Well, yeah, because I guess it was the kind of thing where you couldn't do that stuff in quote unquote polite company. I know what it is. It just dawned on me. The Oracle of Delphi. Oh yeah. That's what they're talking about. Okay. Tell them what the Oracle of Delphi is in case they don't well, know. You know. Well, you know. Uh, back in the ancient Greek days, they had these oracles, and they were these young girls, and they'd stick them in this fucking little cave, and these gases would come out of the fucking ground. They were noxious and poisonous, and they'd poison the damn girl, but she'd start hallucinating, and she'd be able to give out these prophecies. And evidently, they did a bunch of kind of sexual stuff, too, because their brains were frying. Well, yeah. So that's probably what what they're, they're drawing a damn conclusion between the Oracle of Delphi. Yeah. Type stuff. Well, and you know what's interesting, too, as a sort of a segue off of that, right. going back to talking about Eva Carrier, there were... Uh, allegations at the time that her confederate at uh, these seances, you know, the person that was sneaking around like doing all this shit, was her girlfriend. Yeah. And that they would have sex afterwards. And I also read, and I don't know if this is true or not, but that if you were at the seance and you wanted to get in on that shit, they were down. Yeah, as long as you paid. Yeah. Yeah. There's like, hey, can I join in? Well, why not? It kind of would make sense. They were sense. those kind of girls. You it would kind of make sense if you looked at it from the, that period of time, you know, late Victorian era, you know what I mean, early 1900s. People had kind of class, educated people had very classical educations. And yeah. were, it was a lot of stuff about, you know, ancient Greeks and ancient Roman stuff. And that stuff was prevalent in the in those old cultures if, uh, in terms of, you know, like the yeah. Oracle of Delphi and sooth, you know, soothsayers and shit like that. It's probably what they're talking about. Yeah, I guess I guess what they're I talking, what about. talking about. The it's sexuality just, is a heightened. They're seeing sexuality is kind of like a heightened state of awareness. Yeah, you know, is what they're is what they're doing. That but, it's free from earthly, you know what I mean. From the earthly bounds of Victorianism, you know what I mean. Yeah. That it's got to be true. I mean, they're fucking. 
Yeah. That's what they're saying, you know, basically. I always wondered, too, if, like, the whole ectoplasm thing, because, I mean, 99% of the mediums were women. Yeah. Was it almost like they were manifesting, like, semen? <laughs> you well, know what I mean? I think I they mean? talked about that. I think they said that it was sm- it was bodily smells that smelled like... Right. But maybe that's where they got the, and well, maybe that's that where they got the idea from. It's that like they were, just they were transcending fucking gender. You know what I mean? That they were yeah, male that's and what female I'm combined. That's what I. That's what I think they're talking. It's like about. oh well, men can shoot jizz out of their bodies, but so it's like no, well too. now I'm gonna do it too. I'm gonna shoot it in my fingers. Yeah. I'm shoot it, you know what I mean? And you know this that was, was a legend of hell. House, this may have been just the scene of the day. You know this is the this is the fucking hardcore goth. <laughs> goth uh you know what i mean and fucking alternative scene as you see these seances and sex might happen and yeah you paid to show up there but you didn't pay for the sex of course not i don't know that was man. just an added bonus that's just bonus <laughs> shit it, it had to be true i mean we were fucking that's the thinking of the time it had to be true we were fucking well yeah and it was a spiritual experience it was spiritual shit that's yeah. how you like justified it just like the ancient greeks and shit yeah nobody cared who who was, you know, male or female. It was all just a, you know, fucking love fest. Yeah. So it was true. Paranormal as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting all kinds yeah. of transcendent ta- knowledge. I think that's what they're talking about. It could be, yeah. It because, seems less weird in that context. Yeah. Because when you go back and you, you look at, like, um, um, not Anton LaVey. Who's the other guy I was thinking of? Alistair Crowley. Alistair Crowley. That was the same kind of spiel he would give you know yeah that you know as long as you were having sex and it had to be true it yeah. had to be real you know what i mean that's kind of i think that's what they're talking about i feel like cult leaders all over the world have yeah. figured that shit out but, well it was a different time yeah it was a different time now it'd be like whatever people are like man get the fuck out of here. <laughs> we don't fall for that pornhub.com yeah <laughs> You know, right. what I mean? that's what they would say. Yeah, know? it's like now they have internet porn. Yeah, it's like you, you, you're never gonna be able yeah. to like pull that shit off ever again. So yeah, that I wasn't uh, didn't weren't thinking that that's the direction that this. Shit I think was that's probably go, what it was. Yeah. Well, like I said, what now that we've kind of like drilled down on it in that direction, it doesn't seem quite as weird. I think that's part of what was going on. Although, because I always wondered about that ectoplasm. It's like, who the fuck was the first person that came up with that? It's a union of female and male, and it's coming out of a woman, and people can see it, mm, and it's got really pictures weird. in it. <laughs> you know, you paid to see it. It's that kind of shit. You know what I mean? That's some filthy ass motherfuckers yeah. back then. And it was mysterious, you know. Yeah, super mysterious. Yeah. <laughs> Coochie smelling <laughs> ectoplasm. All right, so uh, all right, so after Ted Sirius had kind of like. Uh, fallen out of favor after this photography uh after these two guys at the photography magazine had kind of written about him so it kind of pretty much accused him of being a fraud there was actually this other guy in japan and his name was uh masuaki kyoto and i think when he first came to the attention of the media i think he was only 16 years old now he said that he had psychokinetic power powers and could do the same thing that ted serios could do like you know put images onto film now uh a tv station in the uk uh was interested in this and invited him and said okay well come on the show and do it um so they put him on the show but he couldn't do anything and then they're like the only way that he could quote unquote project mental images onto the film like he said he could do yeah. was if you gave him the package of film and let him go sit by himself in a room for two hours with it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which seemed a little fishy. But he didn't ask for that at the beginning. No, but okay. but he didn't he couldn't do anything. Right, yeah. But they said that was the only way that he could do it. It's like you let him sit in there for a couple of hours with some film and then later Ooh, miracle of miracles! He would yeah. produce like all these that reminds, that rem- images. That reminds me of uh, Yuri Geller and the day that he goes on with the Merv Griffin show. Yeah, it was the Merv Griffin show when, when uh, the amazing Randy handed him the other, you know, handed him that. What was that? They, they were little fucking vials. Yeah. They sort of guessed something was in there. Remember that one? Yeah. He, I can't do it. I can't do it. Yeah, that because he awesome. hadn't like sent shit up beforehand. Right. Now, see Yuri Geller. Who, for a time, probably the most famous psychic in the world. And I, you know, I, look, I'll tell you something. 
I've seen old reruns of his shows, and I remember seeing him when I was a kid. He was an awesome showman. He was, yeah. He was an awesome showman. And in later years, He's he kind like, of said that that's all he was. Kind of like a David Copperfield, but he was very spiritual. Yeah. He'd make you feel good. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. now he kind of ran the gamut. Like, you know, yeah. he could bend spoons. He could stop yeah. clocks. He could do this, that, and the other thing. But he claimed he could do photography as well. Now, what he would do, um, starting in the mid-1990s, is that they would give him a 35 millimeter camera and it still had the lens cap on it. And he would hold it up to his forehead and take a picture with the lens cap still on. And then, ooh, magic, like all these fucking images, just like the Ted Serious yeah. ones, yeah. would supposedly come out. He's like, I'm taking pictures <laughs> of my thoughts, right? So, um, okay. But the only problem with that was <laughs> that... What he would do, he he would pretty much do the same thing that they suspect Ted Sirius would do, that he had a, like a little lens thing like in his hand that he would palm, or that he had had some type of already exposed film already in there, uh, you know, that they would then, it would be like a double exposure. Um, and then one time, they actually gave him the camera, and he was left alone with it for a few minutes. And when they... When they developed the pictures, okay, so the camera had a fisheye lens, which he did not know about. So the picture that was produced was him taking off the lens cap. And because it was a fisheye lens and you could kind of see around, so you could see around mm -hmm. the lens cap and you could see him right, behind yeah. there, like twisting the fucking yeah. lens cap off there, like, I'm going to fucking open yeah. this up and put some yeah. shit in. So they had a picture of him doing that because he didn't know it was a fisheye lens. He thought it was just a normal lens. Mm -hmm. So they actually kind of caught him fake. Well, they caught him faking on several occasions. I mean, uh, and on one show, I can't remember what show it was, but they caught him bending a spoon like against a table edge yeah. when he thought nobody was looking at him um you know he did sh shit like that which that's the thing yuri geller started out as a magician and then later on he segued that into like Ooh, i'm doing some spiritual shit yeah he's kind of like a like a mentalist like a mentalist slash yeah. psychic which yeah. th the thing about it is that you know, magicians, mentalists, stuff like that. Obviously, they do these types of tricks, like, all the time. What they hate are people that come out and say, I, I have that supernatural powers, right, yeah. and that's how I can do it. They're like, no, you don't. You know, it's like, if you know that that's what you're getting, you know, yeah, we're entertaining people. We're doing magic. You know it's not real. Yuri it's a Geller, trick. You and Gary Geller didn't have shit on Chris Angel. Never Chris... I know, <laughs> True. Chris Angel. They can do way better tricks I saw nowadays. one with Chris Angel where Chris Angel was getting run over by a bulldozer. And it's obvious that there's a hole cut in the ground. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't a very good trick. God, man, that, that dude, and the, well, if you looked at Chris Angel, you find out that he had a background in special effects. Yeah. And, of course, and every, all the witnesses and all the crowds that are watching him. They're do all the, plants. They're all plants, the entire thing. So, you know, you might as well not watch Chris Angel. Who is the, uh, like, who's the other one? Uh, oh, um, what's, the, that, the, what's that other the, dude's the name? The one dude that was like, uh, he, he hurt himself by the being... The street a, magic guy? Yeah, the one he that was, was actually like, super good. I thought so. Yeah. Uh, now, was, was it him or the other guy, or was it him or Chris Angel that had the person lay down on the park bench and then pulled them in half? Sounds like something Chris Angel would do, but I'm not, I'm not it sure. It was, I mean, obviously it was a trick, but it was yeah. cool. It was cool looking But the anyway. guy that you're talking about, the one with the street magic, I can't remember his name. David Blaine. David Blaine. I just remember. But David Blaine was an awesome little magician, but he actually did some fucking cool shit. Like, be, he was in that damn... Yeah, he did like a skate artist kind of, like Houdini artist type shit. Yeah, that he was in that sphere that, filled, filled with water. Yeah, for like, and that block of ice. Yeah, and he was in that water for several days, yeah. and it fucked his kidneys up. Yeah, that was those, that he's was the like last, he's hard. That was the last. That was the last stunt that he did. I don't blame him. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think he was ever really the same. He failed at that one. Yeah, and because he failed, you know that he actually was doing those well, tricks of endurance. That's the thing. It's like, yeah. and and people say this about Houdini too. Like, it, you know, 
it's not really accurate to call them magician. I mean, they call them an escape artist. Because they were like that, daredevils too. In a yeah, way. because that you yeah. were really doing it. I mean, they yeah. really did put Houdini in a milk can mm. and like f- did it with chains and stuff. Yeah, he had lock picks and stuff like that. But yeah, if he couldn't get died. out, people he would died. still die. People have died doing those tricks. People have died doing those tricks. Yeah. Well, that magician, we were watching that one the other day where... Um, you know, that, that very famous trick where they put you in a coffin and then like they bury you under the earth and and you have to get out. But some magicians have died doing that because they're actually in there. If the dirt, you know, collapses in on them, it will kill you. Yeah. And it does happen. And it has happened. Yeah. Um, and also guys have been thrown into those damn tanks of water and then they throw that shit into the fucking ocean and they got to come out of there and they never make it out. Yeah. You know, yeah. Because like I said, they are really, it's not a trick. They are really in there. So I still got, I got mad respect for Blaine and I wish Blaine would come back. Yeah. Haven't seen David Blaine in a long time. Although, like I said, I wouldn't blame him if he didn't because he, evidently that, he did some hardcore. That uh, last, that last one nearly killed him. Yeah. Yeah. It fucked his kidneys up. You can't remain submerged for that amount of time. Well, no. Because the the water actually goes into your body. Yeah. Seeps in. Fucks your kidneys Well, up. like I said, was he was in that frozen block of ice for a long time, too. Like what, 48 hours? Something? Yeah, I think it was longer than that. It might have been 72 hours. 72 hours. And wasn't he up... Didn't they put him, like, on top of this really bu- high, like, obelisk or something? Yeah, some they shit? stuck him on top of an obelisk, and he was up there for fucking days and days and days. Yeah. Now, he had diapers on and a catheter. I would hope so. Because that's to. what I was saying. I'm like, oh, God, you're going to be up there shitting yourself. Yeah, all the time. Test, test of endurance. Yeah. And then you have to, like, change your own diapers. Of, ugh, and you have that. to stay awake. Yeah, fuck that. <laughs> mm. Fuck that. But, yeah, I'm see- now I kind of want to go watch that, uh, watch some David Blaine. Yeah. <laughs> it might have been Chris Angel, that one that where he pulled that guy in half. Like I, I, like I said, I know it's a Chris trick, Angel but it was... Chris Angel did a lot of over-the-top shit that was obviously special effects. Yeah, well, I the thing I liked about David Blaine was that he did, like, uh, street magic. Yeah, a little small stuff, you know what I mean? Which is... Pull a string out of his side. You know that yeah. he injected it in there. It was actually in him. You yeah. Know what I, mean? but, you know. I like the one that he did where he would, like, throw a card and it would, like, turn up on, like, yeah, the other side th- of, like, yeah. the glass It looked paranormal, but it wasn't. No. Yeah. I can't figure out how they do it, but right. I know it's a trick. I don't know. But, that, see, that's the thing... I mean, I'm fascinated by this kind of stuff. I'm not a magician. Like, I do know how a lot of tricks are done. Um, but I, I'm just fascinated by that kind of shit. And I love, like, trying to think about how they're done. But that's why I'm so skeptical of, you know, obviously mediums back in the old is like in seances and stuff like that. But I'm skeptical of people like Ted Sirius. I'm skeptical of people who do this type of stuff like in a you know even in a lab environment and stuff because if a magician can replicate it then most of the stuff that would happen in a seance in a victorian seance wasn't even as good as what a magician could do exactly they weren't that good yeah because all. they were just they probably just Using came into it and it was you yeah know, you know well, it's just, and even kind of like some of the... Um, they had hidden people, assistants. And yeah, stuff like I said, the they had like confederates in the background yeah. that were like hidden behind, you know, yeah. walls or like in cabinets or whatever that would pop out in the dark and do shit. Um, you know, but even shit like um, some of the people that they used to test for, you know, psychokinesis and they would like, you know, lean over a table and move stuff. They were doing that with like a piece of thread, like just put, just simple shit yeah. that you wouldn't even, or they were blowing on it or something. Right. It's just simple shit that is easy to do without being detected. But unless there's a magician there looking at you and it'd be like, hey, they've got a piece of thread, you wouldn't necessarily yeah. think of it because you can't see it and it looks like they're doing something magical. Did we get sidetracked from photography? Probably, but We're that- Sidetracked motherfucker. We're but, both, I'm both drinking. I'm, I'm drunk. You still, you drinking? Still? You yeah. Some. Okay. I, I got a little bit left. I'm deep into Kuku Kong. Well, <laughs> that sounded really dirty. Yeah, deep into Well, this. like I said, I mean, when you said we're going to do the Ted Serio show and stuff, yeah. there's not a huge amount about photography because it's kind of its heyday it was in Japan in the early 20th century. Yeah. And then there was... You know, some shit with Ted Sirius. He was kind of like the largest components of it. Yeah, Yeah, and like Yuri Geller did some stuff, but he kind of got caught faking. And he was mostly famous for spoon bending and stopping watches and that kind of stuff more than photography, I feel like. It's it's an interesting... 
It's kind of a shame because it's really an interesting aspect. Even if it's faked, it's still kind of an interesting aspect. Well, you're not going to see it anymore because photographs are gone. Yeah, true. They don't do photography anymore. But I'm also, I like looking at the photos. Yeah. It's just kind of like the Victorian spirit spirit photography. Right. Even though I know that they're fake, they're still like fascinating to look at because yeah. I just like love that kind of shit. Because the premise was is that it was the the mind actually fucking with the chemical properties of film. Right. See. So, that's gone. Film is rare now. Yeah. It's not like it was. Everything's digital. Well, now, if it was, so. um, if you could actually do it through some kind of psychokinetic power, then you'd think you'd be able to do it on a digital camera, too. Y yeah, you'd think it'd be easier. Because it's yeah. just well, zeros and ones. Well, that's what I think, because it was just like... Zeros and ones. Pixel, like light yeah. pixels. You could just put whatever yeah. you wanted in there so i feel like there's probably and i didn't really look that up but i feel like maybe there's some digital photography right. shit going on too i think i actually think there's a band called Be too easy to fake well that's what i mean well it, and that's kind of a problem now too and i think that's why a lot of people are fascinated by like these old spirit photography and stuff like that because now like i said i have photoshop i can make a photo of whatever the fuck you want right <laughs> In, minutes. in less than an hour, yeah. depending on how complicated it is. So, and it's like, and I can make it look real as shit, and yeah. per, and a lot of people can do that. Yeah. So I feel like nowadays it's like, oh, picture didn't happen. It's like it's so fucking shit. I took a picture of him as a kid, yeah, and with, put it into Nick, a picture with evil Knievel. With evil Knievel. and it and looks, I look like I belong there. It looks I had, real. I had my STP jumpsuit and everything. He had a little STP. That's jumpsuit. when I was lying to people online. It was a joke though. <laughs> I was telling them that I was actually hired in at the age of seven, okay? As a consultant. As a consultant to Evil Knievel during his Snake River Canyon jump. <laughs> Remember that? When the rocket ship? Very famous, me and all, yep. Every boy back in the 70s when we were little boys, we knew about Evil Knievel and the Snake River Canyon jump. We had the little wind-up fucking Evil Knievel ro toys with the fucking motor motorcycles and shit. Yeah, my brother had that. That's why I ride bikes today, really, with Evil Knievel. Yeah, evil well, that was evil. a big deal. Yeah, evil. I remember that. Yeah, but yeah, I did. I did. And I a whole... fucking love evil can evil. That hit motherfucker was an asshole. Go look. <laughs> go look up some. Go look up some shows and some interviews with evil can evil. That was the ultimate seventies man. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Ultimate seventies American man. He was like a modern day gladiator. Yeah. Well, like I said, I think yeah. that's why he resonated with a lot of people. Yeah. Like that was a big deal when he was doing that fucking. Yeah, and he, he and the show. motherfucker was a psychopath. Yeah. He oh was. yeah, yeah. He was he, he was a nuts, but that's you have to be nuts to do to do that kind of right, shit. Yeah, of course yeah. you do. He didn't care if he died. Mad he res broke mad every, respect for evil. Knievel. He broke every fucking bone in his body. Yeah, and you can watch it point. live in slow motion, or you can watch it recorded yeah. in slow motion of him just crunching his rolling. You like fucking bone. bones crunching. Yeah. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I did a whole series. I did one of you and Evil Knievel. Yeah, I did one of me you and the Go Go's back when and they the Go Go's. That the Go that was actually my favorite. They one. were using me up as a boy tour. I barely survived that tour. <laughs> I barely fucking survived that tour. Show them the photos, Jane. Me, me. I don't know if I can find them. I don't know if I can find them. They're on Facebook. Me hanging out with fucking um, Andrew Eldridge. Yeah. Yeah, I made a Bowie Sisters one. I made a, Bo Freddie, a Freddie Mercury. That was that time one. Freddie Mer Freddie let me go up there and fucking hang out on stage with him when he was singing. <laughs> me and um, who else was I hanging out with back in the days? Damn, I made a whole bunch of them. I also made actually my other favorite one. The Go Go's one was my favorite because yeah. just because the picture I found of the Go Go's yeah. was like perfectly conducive for like yeah. adding another person in, <laughs> yeah. and it looked like Belinda Carla because she was going like that, like with her arm, and it looked like she had her arm around you. I was like, oh my god, this is beautiful. I was so young, I don't know how I survived that tour, man. Those girls were so demanding of me, I they were just sucking me dry. Yeah, it was like that shit out of Dracula. You remember when when, when yeah. Dracula's women fucking just like that. <laughs> I was just a young man. I was just a young boy at that time. He became a man that day mm. <laughs> on mm. that tour. No, the other one I did this. My second favorite one was uh, I did a cover of Teen Beat or Tiger Beat. Tiger Beat. Tiger Beat. That had a picture. When I was on you the cover of Tiger Beat. When when you were a teenager. I was pretty as a motherfucker when I was a teenager. He was. You should. I I gotta find that. They're on your Facebook page. I was, had that. Jet black hair. I was fucking lily white skin. Looked like a. F I was prettier than Tom Cruise when he was. You were. I was, I was prettier than Tom Cruise. You looked a bit like Tom Cruise, yeah. but not 
quite. You had kind like of a like a baby Tom Cruise. I had a better nose than Tom Cruise. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I. I don't know. Tom Cruise has always been. He's. I'm talking about Tom Cruise from the Legend era. Back back when he was on. The I know. Movie. You know. What I mean? always thought he was kind of weird looking. That's what I'm saying. I was better looking than him. Yeah, I think you were. Yeah, I had a better. And movie. and you had that like it was the '80s, so you had that kind of it wasn't I had a the mu- same hair. It wasn't a mullet. It was no, like, like that. But it was like feathered sort of. Jesse's girl. Yeah. <laughs> it was the '80s. Everybody had hair like that back then. We didn't know what we were doing. I looked like fucking Demi Moore's little brother. <laughs> you did. <laughs> you did. Yeah. It's like, well, it's just kind of like with the, the last review we were talking about of the car and Race can, with the Devil. You can show them those pictures. You can and, show them those pictures. I'll, yeah, I'll find them. They're on your Facebook page, yeah. I think. But um, we were talking about the fucking horrible skinny coke whore pants that they had in yeah. the 70s. The 80s, I don't know what our excuse was. Because I wore some... Cocaine. I was not on cocaine no, in the eighties. I know that. But I'm just talking about. But I didn't wear. I didn't wear super horrible shit. But I did have. Um, you know how everybody had like super big hair. Yeah. Mine was not super big. Although my bangs were super big. You know how everybody like the the back of the hair was kind of flat, but then in the front, like you kind of like spiked up the bangs. There yeah. were like these big fucking bangs in the front. I had that. You know. Yeah. And everybody had the. I had Aussie hairspray. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody I knew in high school. They all had that smell. That in fucking Ju- Aussie, Aussie hairspray smells. Like every terrible. time, I, every time. Well, I think it's like nettle, great nettle, or whatever the fuck it is that mm. they put in there. But um, every time, because they still make Aussie, you guys. So as sometimes still smells the same. Yeah, too. sometimes I'll buy it, and every time I spray it, my hair, I'm like, high school. Yeah. <laughs> it reminds me of high school. Yeah. Every girl I knew in high school, in junior high and high school in the 80s, I had that gel. Had yeah. hairspray in their locker. And they had that gel. Whoosh. I had that gel fucking spiking my hair up like Billy Idol and shit. Yeah. Yeah. With black, black hair, Billy Idol. God. Yeah. So did was. you ever wear parachute pants? No, I didn't have them. I didn't either. Didn't have them. Although I did have a pair of dark red corduroy pants that had a bunch of zippers all over oh, them. Shit. Which I guess. Was cut well. They weren't really like parachute pants because they weren't puffy. They were pegged. We're doing a show, and you're talking about high school. That's all right. We're done with. We're the, done with the show. We're done. With the, done. <laughs> we're done with the thought Okay. I told you you could go off on tangents because it wasn't like. How a long has this late... second segment been going on? I don't know. Forty eight minutes. Forty eight minutes. This is a fucking two hour show. It is. Yeah. That's yeah. okay. People love that shit. Yeah, it's true. They're, and they're we mostly community. mostly talked about spirit photography, kind of yeah. most of the show. It's not spirit photography. It's psychic photography. Yeah, you know what I yeah. mean. Psychic photography. You know what I mean. And I'm getting back to it. Serious. I thought there was something to it, but now that now that she's now that she's fucking brought forth this new information, I'm gonna say nah. He was he was faking it. It was a good story though. What I was, you know I don't I don't like to poop on people's birthday cakes, but yeah. I thought there might have been something to it, but uh, no, probably not. This is just kind of like that whole pterodactyl in the cave thing. Yeah, all over I know again. you're taking me back to that one. Well, it's well. The thing is, I I think that a lot of things, like you hear these stories, like from the '70s, yeah. that that you saw on like Arthur C. Clarke or In Search right. of or whatever, or that you read like in my Reader's Digest. Yeah, so it has but, more gravitas. And then you, well, and then you story. never follow up on it, right, so you yeah. just remember it back then. But then right, right. in the ensuing years, right. like other although, shit has happened. Although I have followed up on something, I'm gonna share this with the audience. The, those big ass fucking triangle UFOs. Mm-hmm. I always thought there was something to that. You know what I mean? The fucking the the witnesses were good. There was lots of them. It's just a strange fucking reports of gigantic triangle UFOs. There's an aviation historian. I forgot his name off the top of my head, but shit, you know. Somebody asked me I, I'll, in the in the comment section. I'll answer. I'll, you know, I'll I'll, I'll find who, out who he is. He he's been fucking watching the black aviation world for fucking years this dude's he's one of the, he's a fucking ultra nerd he's super much super into these fucking aviation world okay he said he's about my age in his 50s and he fucking has been researching tr- uh the, the chevron shaped ufos and triangle shaped ufos for a long time and he came up with a good explanation for that he said that they were first seen around 80s in the Reagan era, all right, and they've kind of dropped off the radar in recent times. He thought that might have been 
a nuclear powered solid body zeppelin basically to house a high power radar system for the star wars at, uh remember the star wars program yeah. to spot incoming icbms over the fucking horizon yeah, a that, radar that could stay on station for months at, to, at, at a time out over the ocean. That actually makes total sense. And that makes perfect sense. Because there was a lot of that. T- I remember that Star Wars shit. There was not yeah. Star Wars the movie. We're talking about Star Wars the... SDI, incom- Strategic Defense The Initiative. incoming, we're going to blow right. up the right. missiles as they're coming and in. And because it would have a nuclear reactor on it, kind of like a submarine, okay, it would violate a shit ton of fucking um, treaties, treaties with yep. the Soviets. It would have been secret to this day. Yeah. It would have just been a basically electric powered Zeppelin using nuclear electric, something that was kind of solid bodied, that housed a big radar and could be big. You know, fucking there's several miles across or a mile across, size of a fucking destroyer, you know, or a, or a submarine really, really in mass, you know, but big, you know, because it's a Zeppelin. And it could just hang out there over the ocean and move around, you know, as needed, you know, but. Uh, you know, might have a crew of 10, you know, and it could just stay deployed for a couple of months at a time. And that makes sense. Well, yeah. An airborne like I, radar system. Like I said, I always kind of felt like, I'm not saying that everybody that sees things that are purported to be UFOs are crazy. I'm yeah. just like a lot of them probably did see shit. But I think 99.99999% of the time, it's more likely that it is some secret yeah. aircraft. That and the saying. reason why... Because, like I said, why aliens, I don't think they would come here. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to differ on that, you know what I mean, for, for now. Well, that's for a different show. Yeah. But I'm saying that <laughs> probably the reason why shit like that would still be secret is because it violated some kind of treaty. Well, yeah, because our ass would be grass if somebody found out about Well, it just would look bad. They couldn't do anything to us. It would right. just look bad that we were violating treaties. Like we ever gave a shit. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's just shut it down. All then. right, so we've gone on long enough about yeah. photography, about Ted Sirius, and about various other topics. Yeah, like group we do. sex and shit. And <laughs> psychedelic drugs. And UFOs. Cheesecloth up in your cooch. Up in your bed, just... You know, <laughs> All that kind of stuff. They're just the bewildering panoply of topics that we always cover here on 13 o'clock. We, yeah. we like to have some variety on each episode of the show. It's an R-rated show. It is. It's yeah. kind of, yeah, it's kind of leaning more toward NC-17, yeah. honestly. <laughs> Sorry about that. We warned you Hope guys. no children are listening. We should put a little warning at the beginning. they're long gone now. Yeah, they're probably. Put, put the kids to bed. Yeah, hey, help us out. Share the channels with friends. Help us grow. YouTube's fucking over, fucking us over in the algorithms for now. It's not just us; it's everybody. But channels aren't growing like they were. They're trying to make everybody fucking watch cable news programs, and cable programs. You know what I mean? Nobody wants cable. Well, YouTube that's... exists because cable sucks. Well, that's not gonna work out. So yeah, I'm not worried about it. Right, it's not gonna but work. But like I said, you know, we have our six thousand subscribers, and however many people listen to us on iTunes, I don't honestly don't We could, don't we could know. use four more thousand, though. Yeah. So it's good. Okay. That'd be nice. Yeah. Yeah. If if every single one of you passed it on yeah. to other people, it's like you know, right. I, I I realize like not everyone's gonna be into this shtick here. Yeah. I know, because I know we're annoying as shit sometimes, <laughs> and we're kind of assholes. Yeah. And but no, you know, it ain't that bad. Yeah, that's true. It ain't true. that bad. No, but I'm just saying, I, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to come from you know a point of view of like somebody be like, I don't want these assholes. Yeah. Like, be, 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 be swearing at me because you know how fucking some people are about swearing but whatever all right but anyways if you like the show like share subscribe on all your social media it really does help a lot like i said i'm trying to get more subscribers especially since youtube seems to be like slowing everybody down yeah they are yeah um you know so whatever uh if you'd like to financially support the show you can go to our patreon page patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast and uh, that'll be, I, I've been started to do like uh, giving you early access to all of our uh, episodes and like, you know, heads up on what the next week's topics and movies and shit are going to be. So if you want that, just drop by there, give us a buck or two. That'd be pretty cool. You can also go to our blog, 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com. And there's a little button in the sidebar to a PayPal account. If you'd like to give a one-time donation, that would also be much appreciated. Remember these regular episodes here come out every Tuesday. We also of 13 o'clock movie retrospective usually an older movie that comes out every friday and 13 o'clock matinee that's three new movies in the theater and that comes out every sunday so check them out if you haven't already and 
this will that will do it for episode 142 we will see you next time bye